In the previous video, we saw that replicating units at the different levels of organization of living systems can evolve. And in doing so, we saw that the pursuit of evolutionary interest at any one level can clash with the interests of other levels of organization. An example of this is cancer, where the unchecked proliferation of a cell line can end up becoming lethal or very harmful to the individual. We also saw that selfish units can be harmful to other such units at the same level of organization. For example, we saw genes that increase their presence in offspring, so-called segregation distorter genes. These genes can, by their action, negatively affect the reproduction of other genes and bias the sex ratio of the offspring. We would therefore expect to see other genes evolve a response, and indeed we do see this. Mechanisms that suppress segregation distortion have been known about since the 50s. In the words of Egbert Lee, the genome is like a parliament of genes. Each acts in its own self-interest, but if its acts hurt the others, they will combine together to suppress it. In this video, we will explore more of these mechanisms that suppress selfishness. Suppression of selfish behavior occurs at numerous levels of organization. For example, between multiple genomes within the same cell. Each of our cells contains structures that function as the energy factories of the cell, the mitochondria. These mitochondria were once upon a time, over one and a half billion years ago, independent organisms which entered into a more or less perfectly tight, mutually beneficial relationship with the cells in which they reside. This is called endosymbiosis. Mitochondria are only ever passed on through the egg cell, so by the mother, not the father. This fact, coupled with the fact that mitochondria still have their own DNA, sets the stage for conflict with the cell nucleus. The nucleus contains the lion's share of the organism's DNA, and it is passed on both by mothers and fathers. From the mitochondria's perspective, it is beneficial to be inside a mother, because that's the only way it's going to be passed on. The nucleus doesn't care, so to speak, whether it's inside a mother or a father. This conflicting interest between mitochondria and nucleus has resulted in a phenomenon where normally hermaphroditic plants, of both male and female, have their pollen production disrupted by the mitochondria. In plants, pollen are the male reproductive cells which don't pass on mitochondria. So, through disruption of pollen production, hermaphroditic plants effectively become females. This phenomenon is known as cytoplasmic male sterility, or CMS. Through CMS, a potentially large investment in pollen is diverted to female reproduction, which therefore benefits the mitochondria. However, the resulting skewed sex ratio could be bad for the reproductive prospects of both nucleus and mitochondria in the long run. The nucleus, which doesn't benefit from CMS, has therefore evolved a suppressor gene called Restorer of Fertility, or RF, which restores pollen production. You can imagine that we expect to see suppression of selfish behavior at all levels of organization where evolution occurs. For example, numerous mechanisms have evolved to suppress unchecked cell proliferation. Among these are programmed cell death, or apoptosis, and the policing of stray cells by the immune system. Now, in most of these cases, the selfishness and the response are more or less hardwired, without a great deal of scope for choosing among different strategies and different degrees of selfishness. This is different in the behavior of social animals. Consider the following scenario. A population where everyone is altruistic to one another, there is zero selfishness, all cookies are shared, for example. I derive some benefit when others share a cookie with me, although I also incur the cost of sharing whatever cookies I happen to come across. Now, a dishonest individual enters into the population. This individual doesn't share but only takes, all benefit, no cost. We would expect the rest of the population to catch on, even if that might only be in evolutionary time, so to speak. We would expect the indiscriminate sharing to stop. But this also means that everyone loses the benefit we used to have from all the sharing we did with one another. So it turns out that there's a third strategy, which retains the possibility of mutually beneficial sharing, but protects against cheating. And it goes like this. Initially, I will share with whoever I come across. However, 
if that individual cheats me by not sharing back next time, I will punish this by also not sharing. In other words, my strategy is to mirror the other player's move. The players that follow this strategy, called tit for tat, derive more mutual benefit than those that either never or always share. It is hence a so-called evolutionarily stable strategy, which is impervious to cheating. The science that attempts to identify such stable strategies is called game theory. It was largely developed in order to derive a predictable nuclear posture for the American government during the Cold War. The person that did most of this work, John Nash, was immortalized in the movie A Beautiful Mind. You might remember it. So, we have so far seen that closely related individuals might appear to be altruistic to one another, but did so actually because it increases their inclusive fitness. That was in the previous video. Now we've seen that the participants in a game of tit for tat might also be nice to one another, though again this appears to actually be enlightened self-interest, based on the expectation of reciprocity. In the next video we'll make a final attempt to see whether anyone ever self-to-see attempts to advance the greater good.